Good afternoon, my name is Sabrina Sanchez and we are here with the Interim Chancellor, Ralph Hexter. Thank you so much for joining us today. So you are the third person we will be interviewing for Spark segment. Um, so I guess, you know, Spark is really highlighting the person, who they are. We want to know who you are as a Chancellor, but we also want to know who you are. And so I think um, our first question would be just tell us about yourself, like where did you come from? Gosh. It's, first, it's a great honor to be on Spark, and so great to be doing this with you, Sabrina. I'm a professor. I start with that. Um, I'm someone who just fell in love with books and literatures. I loved school, and when I went off to college, uh, I had the rather perhaps unusual ambition of becoming a professor of medieval literature. I was just fascinated, perhaps in part because I was an avid reader of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings when I was in junior high school and high school. In any event, I um, studied a lot of languages and discovered that this field called comparative literature was good for me because it really meant you could follow questions you had anywhere you wanted. And uh, eventually I became a faculty member, uh, but where I came from that got me here had to do with something that happens sometimes to professors as they serve as chairs of departments and I guess someone or more than one person thought I had a knack at that and I sort of enjoyed doing it. So eventually became a dean. I was at uh, UC Berkeley mm -hmm. as a faculty member and became a department chair and then the dean of arts and humanities. And um, let's see, the executive dean of the College of Letters and Science. And then my life took a rather surprising turn because I was thinking, hmm, this is an interesting path. Is this the path that I want to go on and, and see about possibly becoming a college president or a university chancellor. Um, and I looked into that, um, but I was also, at that time, this was now the early to middle 2000s, mm -hmm. and I was, um, so I've been uh, self-identified as a gay male since the time I was a sophomore in college, long, long ago, but I was very aware that um, there was a glass ceiling. It was very, very rare for someone who was a self-identified gay person, man or woman, to become a college or university president. So I had to take that into account and um, as it happened there was a small college in Massachusetts, Hampshire College. After a few years there I really felt the call to come back to a research university and I was fortunate to discover the opportunity of becoming provost at UC Davis. So that's what brought me back here in January of 2011. Wow. So you were mentioning that um, you identify as gay. Can you tell me your experience and how it was during your time to work in a profession um, within higher admin? Um, what was that like identifying and was there difficulties? Talk a little more about the glass ceiling as well because I'm, I'm not sure if our viewers may know what that means. The, what's glass about it is it appears as if the institutions are welcoming. They may have non-discrimination clauses or claim that everyone has equal opportunity to a career path. But you don't see the ceiling, but it's there if you look at the numbers. Why are there so few women executives at the top of Fortune 500 companies? You know, everyone talked a good game, but no one was actually rising to that top position. And the same thing was true in the world of higher education, there are very few, if any, gay or lesbian college presidents in the South or Southeast. But um, you know, even at a school that has, say, a non-discrimination clause, y you can f sometimes fall into this trap, be particularly because the president is the chief fundraiser. And, and this was literally said, if not to me, it was said to other people. Oh, you know, I don't have any problem with a gay president, but some of our more conservative donors won't respond well to this. And so it's a way of sort of holding the institution back because you're imagining what donors say. Has that ever deterred you during your um, advancement in your career, having that glass ceiling? So at the risk of really going back in, into ancient history, <laughs> um, I have to really thank my parents because my parents supported me implicitly and explicitly so much that I had a great deal of confidence. I came out myself very soon after Stonewall. I know I look much younger than I am, <laughs> but I was 
somehow very fortunate that I didn't have a great deal of concern. Once I figured out myself um, what my sexual orientation was, I just got involved in the then very, very, very young group in our college for but gay and lesbian students. And I've been pretty fearless about being out all along. You could possibly chalk it up to privilege in other sectors, but sometimes that can empower someone to help break through in a new dimension. It's very funny. In retrospect, there are a couple of instances where upon reflection, looking back, I said, I wonder if some homophobia was at work there. But honestly, I've had a very successful career. People have known that I've been gay. I've wanted them to know because I don't want someone to hire me or be hired in an institution where that would be a problem. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that you're open about that. I want to kind of go back to when you were talking about your passions. What led you to UC Davis? Uh, my partner and I have horses. One of our horses was sick, colicked, and the vet there, after treating him, said, I can't help him. Your only chance is that you take him to UC Davis. We brought him up. He received wonderful treatment. He's 38 years old now, which is really old for a horse. Uh, but um, years later, when I was in Massachusetts, hoping to be able to find a way to return to the world of research universities, I discovered there was a, an opening. The UC Davis was looking for a provost, um, applied, and you know, and I, I'm very happy with how it developed. Still, it wasn't bad that I had that deep and somewhat emotional connection with the vet school. I can just imagine. Yes, that's really interesting. So you were a provost. So what does a provost do? I think sometimes we hear it, but I don't think, I, I personally didn't know until I started researching it a little more. Tell us what you did as a provost. You know, classically the provost is internally focused. Um, one of the most important things is that all of the deans of the schools and colleges report to the provost. We are, we have a vice provost for uh, global affairs now. So it's it's a pretty big job and there's practically no detail that you don't get involved in. You arrived in 2011 and then so you were with uh, Chancellor Katehi for that duration of time and you witnessed quite a lot during that time as I'm sure. So did her resignation come as a surprise to you? Well um, the resignation came after um, a, a, a summer of some turbulence. Did it come as a surprise to me at that point? Not really. Um, you know, I was much more surprised when um, the president put her on leave in, in April and, and told me that I was going to become acting chancellor. So that was, that was difficult. So you say you're surprised, and I'm, I can see why, right? Because as provost, you fill in um, if the chancellor cannot. So tell me, w describe what that felt like to then become the chancellor, and especially in a situation where there was so much controversy. As, as someone put it, almost the next day, um, a sort of muscle memory, if you could put it that way, clicked in. And though it didn't... Um, make up for some of the, 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 the regret that things were developing this way. It enabled me to function um, because I, in a sense, knew the job. It was almost, almost a little calmer because there had been so much tension up to that point. Can you describe a little the process from being a provost to then being interim chancellor, especially such a quick transition, I'm sure? Um, what was that like for you? It literally came as a total shock when I was told that I would step into this role. Somehow I then said, okay, I know we need to do these things. I said, I think we should meet in the office at 7, start planning some communication strategy. And somehow just getting into it was, um, it almost helped me um, focus and calm my energies. So by that afternoon, we had a, basically a press conference. And so that was when the, the, the memory of just doing those things fully kicked in. What did it mean to come into a campus that was still feeling, I guess, hurt and frustrated and then to be interim chancellor? Mm. We did have the long period when there were students in the fifth floor lobby in Rack. That had 
actually ended before. So Merak was resolved from that point of view. Whatever shock and disappointment they may have had, there was also a, okay, we're into a new phase. You know, I, I, what I was focused on was, and I knew that what I needed to do was just not add to any disruption. Be as calm and deliberate as possible. I met with a lot of people and assured people that we're going to move forward. You know, the university carries on and that strength is there and I think the university can rely on its, on its great progress to feel good about itself. Speaking of challenges, you had mentioned that you worked at Hampshire College and you were president. So you've had experience within higher administration, and for the viewers that don't know, your um, presidency at Hampshire College, you experienced controversy similar to what happened under Chancellor Katehi's supervision, such as the whereabouts of funds and student protests and staging sit-ins. So with all of this, how would you respond to critics near and far who may question your position as interim chancellor? Well, as you said, there's hardly any leader who doesn't face some controversy. Um, if what you're getting at is that um, some of the concerns that some of the protesters had mean that I'm not qualified or shouldn't be in trust with that, I reject that utterly. I find most distressing is when there are untruths that are circulated. So I, I have no doubts and the people who um, really knew and d know everything about it have no doubts about uh, my time at Hampshire. And so the fact that there were um, protests and some people claim X, Y, or Z, that doesn't touch me at all. Good. I'm glad to know. And so we're talking about, you know, multiple controversies, right? And I think a really th big thing that's been talked about on campus is transparency. So as interim chancellor, how have you strived to pr um, provide more transparency within the UC Davis community as well as within the larger community of Davis? Well, so one of the things to do is, I mean, as you know, communicate, communicate, communicate. I, I wish more students had a fuller sense of the totality of the university. I suggested to students, I'm really um, open to students saying, um, I'd like to shadow you. So in fact, we almost instantly had over 20 students respond and say, I'd like to do that. Um, this wasn't this time, but I, I do remember a student who had the, two students who had the quote-unquote pleasure of sitting in on a whole hour-long discussion of compliance. It's, I think it's a really good reminder for people to see um, really all the different issues that are at play at this enormous and complex university. And in terms of um, transparency, there's also been a lot of talk within ASUCD about the transparency of the next search for the chancellor. And um, recently, last week, they had le legislation where they wanted to halt the search for the new chancellor. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me preface it by saying that I have no control over the search. It's run mm -hmm. at the level of the regents and the president. You know, I'll, let me just address one it, one part of the concern, which has to do with the fact that the finalists don't appear on campus and people can't see them and comment on them, including from the position of President Hampshire College, is that if, you, if it became known that you were a candidate, a finalist in any other search, you'd be over. I'm not saying you'd be fired, but you would lose your credibility your prestige, because when you're the leader of a campus, you have to be um, known that you're a hundred percent behind it. It's not, it's not doable to have it be known that you're considering leaving. That's just a fact of life. Uh, and and in and in fact, um, you know, I um, I'd already announced that I was leaving Hampshire before I was publicly a finalist here. It's just you're not going to have those people in the pool if you don't have confidentiality at that stage. So that's just one aspect of the transparency that I think is, is needed. I, I, I do hope that everyone who has an opinion will send it forward because those are looked at and understand that in this case, um, finalists are not going to appear on campus. That's really interesting because I actually didn't know that. That's really complex. I think one of the things that 
I would ask then is, do you have any advice that would help bridge that transparency since we can't necessarily see the candidates? They're at a stage where they're still reflecting on and trying to create the profile of the, in a sense, the ideal chancellor. So please send in ideas about what characteristics the next chancellor should have because I've overseen a lot of these searches. My experience of these recruitment advisory committees is that they work very hard and they, um, and I will also say I cannot speak about President Napolitano, but um, when I get advice from a recruitment advisory committee, it means a very great deal. Thank you. I think that helps a lot for viewers who are unaware of the search right now or who really don't follow what's going on, right? I want to go into discussing a little more about the new chancellor. I know as interim, I'm sure you get discussions a lot about this. Um, as the current interim chancellor, would you ever be interested in becoming the permanent chancellor? Well, what I say to that question, and of course I get it, <laughs> is that I'm very willing to talk to the committee. Uh, I know that what has to happen is for a person, him or herself, to feel aligned with the goals that the committee and the appointing authority has put forward. Say, we want to do this. And you know yourself that, oh, I can do that. Um, but if you looked at a job description and said, you know, that isn't me, you don't even, th that wouldn't be appropriate. If the decision of the committee and the, including the president, is that they want a, a new leaf to be turned over, if they want a complete break with the past, then I'm really not a credible candidate. If they are considering an evolution, um, some continuity, some change, some adjustment, then I probably am a credible candidate. Thank you. I'm interested to see how the search will progress. And based on your experience, you know, as an interim chancellor, as provost, as a former president, what advice would you give the next chancellor? Take your time. If someone comes from outside to our university, you have to do a lot of listening. If you're new to an institution, you have to understand what the heart and soul of the, of the place is. Uh, you have to get to listen carefully and understand and learn almost a new language. But if you come from afar to UC Davis and aren't someone from within, you need to take time to listen and learn. I like that. So now that we have got to learn about Ralph Hexter outside of interim chancellor, but also as interim chancellor, what message um, will you leave the UC Davis community? I think UC Davis knows that it is a great university and it needs to be fully proud of what it is doing and realize that there really are no limits to what it can achieve. Um, we are part of a great system, but we are unique. We have synergies here that you can't have anywhere else in terms of research. That's a great value to us. Our student body is remarkable. We have um, a student body that is so accomplished, so hardworking, so dedicated to seeing the world become a better place and with remarkable diversity. Um, sure, we have our challenges, but no family doesn't have moments of challenge. But I think we should be proud and we should love ourselves because it's a really great university. Thank you. Um, and this was Spark Segment with Sabrina Sanchez and Ralph Hexter. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you as the third interview. Thank you, Sabrina.